know I'm loving it. Are you loving it? Yeah, you know you loving it. And if you're loving it, you can't get enough of it. Put a hand high, right where the other is. To the weak, but can't find that quitter in me. It's that bit of sweet literature that literally is straight. Walk with the Prince of Peace, see where these footprints lead. Hey, this is Dr. K from Ryan Medical School, and this is the first part of our series of Intern 101, the basic stuff you need to know in your first year of residency. This also applies to your first year of nursing as well as if you're a medical assistant. So let's talk about IV fluids, the concepts behind IV fluids, the different types of IV fluids, as well as what situations you should use them in. So what are IV fluids? IV fluids are products that you administer through an IV. They help maintain blood pressure, hydration, and electrolyte balance. They're split up into two types of fluids. One are crystalloids and the other one are called colloids. Crystalloids are molecules that are small enough to pass through the membrane of a blood vessel. Colloids, for example, like albumin, are large molecules that generally do not pass through a blood vessel membrane. To understand the concept of how IV fluids work, you need to understand the different fluid compartments of the body. The fluid compartments consist of an intracellular fluid space and an extracellular fluid space. The extracellular fluid space consists of intravascular volume, so within the blood vessels, and the interstitial fluid, while the intracellular fluid is all the fluid within cells. Your total body water content equals your extracellular fluid plus your intracellular fluid, while the extracellular fluid, so that fluid outside of the cells, consists of one-third of your intravascular space plus two-thirds of your interstitial space. The interstitial volume is the amount of fluid that's in the tissues but not within the cells. Not only are fluid compartments of the body important to understanding IV fluids, but also the content of these fluids as well. We quantify the amount of ions or content of a fluid by osmolality. The normal osmolality is 280 osmoles. Osmolality dictates how fluids move from one compartment to the other. A lot of times we first call this diffusion, when a fluid moves from one space to another space. But if fluid moves past a semipermeable membrane, like a cell wall or a cell membrane, we call that osmosis. Let's go over a quick example of osmosis. So here we have two fluid compartments separated by a broken dotted line representing a semipermeable membrane. You can think of it as a cell membrane or the membrane of a vessel wall. On one side we have water plus 40 milliequivalents of sodium and the other side we just have water. Now if you let these two fluid compartments equilibrate across the semipermeable membrane, the sodium will partially move to the right to the compartment with only water because there's greater osmolality on the left side, so the system tries to equilibrate and include the same osmolality on the right. So sodium will diffuse to that right side, creating the equal balance. Now that's a real quick example of osmosis. And we term osmolality with three main terms. One, isotonic. So isotonic means a fluid has similar plasma osmolality as a serum, or around 280 osmoles. Hypotonic, less than plasma osmolality, so less than 280 osmoles. And hypertonic, usually greater than plasma osmolality, so greater than 280 osmoles. So first off, let's talk about some specific IV fluids, as well as their osmolality. We'll be covering D5W, normal saline, half normal saline, D5 with half normal saline, 3% saline, and lactated readers. We're looking at the sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarb, dextrose, as well as the osmolality content of each of these fluids. In D5W, you have what that means is 5% of dextrose in free water, or just plain water. So if you imagine a thousand liters, so one liter bag containing 5%, if you calculate that out, that would have to be, you'd have, to have 50 osmoles of dextrose to get 5% of dextrose. So that's why you have 50 equivalents, because 50 over 1,000 is 5%. The osmolality of D5W is 278. So it's just slightly hypotonic, but we can basically treat it as an isotonic solution. Now normal saline contains 154 milliequivalents of normal saline, 
154 milliequivalents of chloride. That should be equal amounts for them to be isoelectric, meaning same positives as negatives. And the osmolality here is 286. Again, normal saline is slightly hypertonic, but very close to plasma osmolality. So we use it as an isotonic solution. Now half normal saline, as you expect, is half of that of normal saline. So sodium 77, chloride of 77, and milliosmoles of 143, making it isotonic. D5 half normal saline surprisingly has the same features of half normal saline, 77 sodium, 77 chloride, but also contains 50 milliequivalents of dextrose, giving it that 5% of dextrose, or D5. It is a milliosmol of 154. Now it's slightly above just half normal saline. You may be like, why is it only just a little bit above? Well, D5 half normal saline is a very hypotonic solution because when you administer D5 half normal saline, that D5 gets eaten up or consumed by the body very quickly. So it turns to just half normal saline. Now 3% normal saline is much more hypertonic because it contains just over three times as much of sodium and chloride than normal saline, making it a hypertonic solution. Now the final solution we come to is lactated ringers. It contains 130 of sodium, 4 of potassium, 109 of chloride, 28 of bicarb, and 50 of dextrose. It has basically a little bit of everything. Its osmolality comes out to around 272. So slightly hypotonic, but generally we consider it an isotonic solution. Now let's take a look at when you can use each of these solutions. But keep in mind the tonicity when you're using these solutions. So first off, if the patient's hypoglycemic, either they've gotten too much insulin or they're not eating very well, you can give them either D5W as a drip or D50 in amps, meaning they give you about 50 cc's of D50. D50 is 50% dextrose. So whatever number follows that D means the percentage of dextrose within that solution. For hypotension, you generally want to use an isotonic solution. So lactated ringers or normal saline. Recently, a study was produced in JAMA called the association between a chloride liberal or normal saline versus chloride restrictive lactated ringers intravenous fluid administration strategy and kidney injury in critical ill adults. The study compared lactated ringers and normal saline and how the development of kidney injury related between giving one or the other in the ICU setting. Though the study concluded lactated ringers was associated with less kidney injury than normal saline, the data was very limited and the study was quite faulty. But what What's important about the study, it brings up an important point that more research needs to be done into IV fluids and their actual effects on the body. Though there has been no demonstrated evidence for or against lactated ringers or normal saline. Now for hyponatremia, commonly we use either normal saline or 3% saline. This is very key here. If a patient is very hyponatremic and they're actively seizing, you want to get that sodium level up. So that's in that case, you would use 3% saline. But you do not want to increase it more than 10 milliequivalents within 24 hours. Now, if they're hyponatremic and not actively seizing, try to use normal saline so you can bring them up very slowly. If you notice you're bringing them up too fast, use a hypotonic solution like D5 half normal, to level off their sodium level. That way you can prevent them from developing central pontine myelinolysis because they were corrected too quickly. All right, that was a brief review of IV fluids, the mechanisms, the different types, their tonicity, as well as the situations in which you can use them. If you like this video, give it a like. Make sure to share this on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. If you have any comments, place them down below or suggestions for future videos. And most importantly, subscribe. We also have an iTunes podcast called iMed School, where you can download these videos onto your iPod or iPhone and take a listen to them. And that's it. So this is Dr. K from iMedical School. I'll see you next time.